The Oxford Bookworms Library. Stage 4. Silas Marner by George Eliot. Chapter 3. Where is Silas's gold? When Dunstan Cass left the cottage, Silas Marner was only a hundred metres away. He was walking home from the village, where he had gone to buy what he needed for his next day's work. His legs were tired, but he felt almost happy. He was looking forward to supper time, when he would bring out his gold. Tonight he had an extra reason to hurry home. He was going to eat hot meat, which was unusual for him. And it would cost him nothing, because someone had given him a piece of meat as a present. He had left it cooking over the fire. The door key was needed to hold it safely in place, but Silas was not at all worried about leaving his gold in the cottage with the door unlocked. He could not imagine that a thief would find his way through the mist, rain and darkness to the little cottage by the quarry. When he reached his cottage and opened the door, he did not notice that anything was different. He threw off his wet coat and pushed the meat closer to the fire. As soon as he was warm again, he began to think about his gold. It seemed a long time to wait until after supper, when he usually brought out the coins to look at. So he decided to bring out his gold immediately, while the meat was still cooking. But when he took up the floorboards near the loom and saw the empty hole, he did not understand at once. His heart beat violently as his trembling hands felt all around the hole. There was nothing there. He put his hands to his head and tried to think. Had he put his gold in a different place and forgotten about it? He searched every corner of his small cottage until he could not pretend to himself any more. He had to accept the truth. His gold had been stolen. He gave a wild, desperate scream and stood still for a moment. Then he turned towards his loom and almost fell into the seat where he always worked. He touched the loom to make sure it too had not been stolen. Now he was beginning to think more clearly. A thief has been here. If I can find him, he'll have to give back my gold. But I was only away for a short time, and there's no sign of anyone entering the cottage. He wondered whether it was really a thief who had taken his money, or whether it was the same cruel god who had already destroyed his happiness once. But Silas preferred to suspect a thief who would perhaps return the money. He began to think it must be Jem Rodney, a local poacher, who had known about Silas's money and who sometimes visited the cottage. Silas felt stronger now that he thought he knew the thief. I must go and tell the squire and the police, he said to himself. They'll make Jem give me back the money. So he hurried out in the rain without a coat and ran towards the rainbow. He thought he would find the most important people in Ravelow at the public house, but in fact most of them were at Mrs Osgood's birthday dance. There were, however, five villagers at the Rainbow, enjoying an interesting conversation about ghosts while drinking their beer. I tell you, people have seen ghosts, the butcher said, and I'll tell you where too, behind the church. That's right, agreed old Mr Macy. You young ones aren't old enough to remember, but people have seen ghosts near the church since I was a boy. Oh yes, it's true. The farrier laughed scornfully. Ghosts! People imagine they see things on a dark night. You can't make me believe in ghosts. It's a question of fact. There are no ghosts. Now, now, began the landlord, who always tried to keep the peace. In some ways you're all wrong, and in some ways you're all right. That's my opinion. There are ghosts, and there aren't. Well, 
that's what people say. And just then, Silas's white face appeared suddenly in the doorway. He had run all the way from his cottage, so he could not speak for a moment. He stared silently at the men with his strange staring eyes, looking exactly like a ghost. For a few minutes, nobody said anything, while Silas tried to control his breathing. Then the landlord spoke. What do you want, Master Marner? Come, tell us. Robbed! cried Silas, suddenly able to speak. I've been robbed! I want the police and the squire! He waved his arms wildly as he spoke. Hold him, Jem! said the landlord to the poacher, who was sitting near the door. I think he's gone mad! But Jem moved quickly away. Not me, he replied. I don't want anything to do with a ghost. Jem Rodney! cried Silas, turning and staring at the man he suspected. Yes, Master Marner, answered Jem, trembling a little. If it was you who stole my money said Silas, going close to Jem. Just give it back to me, and I won't tell the police. Please, just give it back. Stole your money? cried Jem angrily. I'll throw this glass at you if you accuse me of stealing your money. Come now, Master Marner, said the landlord firmly, taking Silas by the arm. You must explain what you mean if you want us to believe you and sit down by the fire to dry your clothes. You're very wet. That's right, said the farrier. No more staring like a madman. That's what I thought you were at first. Not a ghost, of course. The weaver sat down in the centre of the little group of men and told his story. It felt strange but pleasant to him to talk to his neighbours and tell them his problems. The men realised at once that Silas was telling the truth. They had suspected him of working for the devil, but they knew now that the devil was no longer taking care of him. Well, Master Marner, said the landlord in the end, you mustn't accuse poor Jem. He sometimes steals a chicken, we all know that, but he's been sitting here drinking with us all evening, so he's not the thief. That's right, said old Mr. Macy. You can't accuse someone who hasn't done anything wrong, Master Marner. These words brought the past back to Silas, and he remembered standing in front of his accusers in the Light Street Chapel. He went up to Jem. I was wrong, he said miserably. I'm sorry, Jem. I had no reason to accuse you, but... Where can my gold be? Perhaps some stranger came to your cottage while you were out, said the farrier. But we must report the robbery to the police and the squire immediately. Next morning, when the whole village heard about the stolen gold, they all discussed it excitedly. A few people still did not trust Silas or believe his story, most people, however, were suspicious of the peddler who had visited Ravelo the month before. Perhaps he had returned to hide near the quarry and steal the money when Silas left his cottage. Several villagers thought they remembered his evil-looking face and felt sure he was not honest. Silas himself remembered that the peddler had come to his cottage door recently, he hoped the peddler was indeed the thief, because the police could catch him and make him give back the money. His home seemed very empty to him without his gold, and he desperately wanted to get it back. Chapter 4 Godfrey is in trouble Godfrey was not very surprised to find that Dunstan had not come home after his day's hunting. Perhaps he was staying the night at a public house. But when Dunstan did not return home the next day, Godfrey began to worry about wildfire. 
He did not trust his brother, and wondered if Dunstan had gone away to spend the money on gambling. So he decided to go to look for him. On the road near Avalo, he met his neighbour John Bryce, who had arranged to buy Wildfire from Dunstan. Well, Godfrey," said Bryce, "did your brother tell you about the horse?" "What do you mean, John?" replied Godfrey quickly. "No, he hasn't been home yet." "What's happened to my horse?" "Ah, so he was yours, was he?" Dunstan told me you'd given him Wildfire. I was going to buy him, you know. What's Dunstan done? Is Wildfire hurt? Asked Godfrey crossly. Worse than that, answered Bryce. I'm afraid your horse is dead. We've only just found him. Your brother rode him to the hunt, and the horse fell at a gate and broke his back. So. You haven't seen Dunstan since yesterday. No, and he'd better not come home now," replied Godfrey angrily. "How stupid I was to trust him with my horse. But where can Dunstan be? I suppose he wasn't hurt because we didn't find him near the horse. Him," said Godfrey bitterly. "Oh, he'll be all right. He'll never be hurt." He only ever hurts other people. We'll hear of him soon enough. Don't worry. Bryce said goodbye and rode away. Godfrey rode slowly back into Ravello, thinking about what he would very soon have to do. There was no longer any escape. He must confess the whole truth to his father. For the rest of the day, he planned what he would say. He would explain that he had lent Fowler's money to Dunstan, because Dunstan knew his secret. That would be the right moment to tell the squire about his secret marriage to Molly. But he'll be very angry, thought Godfrey, and when he's angry with people, he just wants to punish them. He won't listen or calm down. But perhaps he'll keep my secret. He's so proud of the family name. And if he disinherited me, everyone would talk about it. When he went to bed that night, Godfrey thought he had decided what to say. But when he woke up in the morning, he could not see any reason to confess to the marriage. Why should he lose the chance of marrying Nancy? Why should he tell the whole truth now, when perhaps it was not necessary? No. It would be better to go on in the same way as before. Perhaps Dunstan would stay away for a while, and then there would be no need to tell his father about Molly. But today I'll tell the squire about the money. He thought, he'll have to know about that. Godfrey was already in the dining room when his father arrived for breakfast. The squire sat down at the head of the table. And ordered the servant to bring him some beer. Haven't you had breakfast yet, Godfrey? He asked. Yes, I have, sir," replied Godfrey. "But I was waiting to speak to you. Well, you young people have plenty of time," answered the squire. "We older ones have to do all the work." Godfrey looked straight at his father. Sir. He said bravely, "I must tell you, something very unfortunate has happened to Wildfire." What? Has he broken a leg? I thought you could ride better than that. Well, you can't expect me to pay for a new horse. I'm very short of money at the moment, and I'm angry with Fowler. He still hasn't paid me what he owes me. If he doesn't pay today, he'll go to prison. The squire's face was red, and he banged angrily on the table as he spoke. "It's worse than breaking a leg," continued Godfrey miserably. "Wildfire's dead, but I don't want you to buy me another horse. I just feel sorry I can't pay you. You see, sir, the truth is, I'm very sorry. Fowler did pay the money." 
he gave it to me, and I was stupid enough to let Dunstan have it. And he was going to sell Wildfire, and then I was going to repay you the money. The squire's face was purple now, and for a moment he could not speak. You. you let Dunstan have my money? Why did you give it to him? And why did he want it? Where's Dunstan now? He'll answer my questions, or leave this house. Go and fetch him at once. Dunstan hasn't come home, sir. The horse was found dead, and nobody knows where Dunstan is. Well, why did you let him have my money? Answer me! said the squire, staring angrily at Godfrey. Well, sir, I don't know, replied Godfrey, hesitating. He was not good at lying. And was not prepared for his father's questions. You don't know, the squire repeated scornfully. Well, I know why. I think you've done something wrong, and you've bribed Dunstan to keep it a secret. That's it, isn't it? The squire had made a very clever guess, and Godfrey's heart banged in sudden alarm. He was not ready to confess everything yet. Well, sir. He said, trying to speak carelessly, "It was just a little business between Dunstan and me. You wouldn't be interested in it, you know." How old are you now? Twenty-six? Asked the squire angrily. Old enough to look after your money and mine too. I've been much too generous to you boys, but I'm going to be harder on you all from now on. You've got a weak character, Godfrey, like your poor mother. I think you need a wife who knows what she wants, because you can't decide anything by yourself. When you were thinking of marrying Nancy Lammeter, I agreed, didn't I? Have you asked her or not? She hasn't refused to marry you, has she? No, I haven't asked her," said Godfrey, feeling very hot and uncomfortable. But I don't think she'll accept me. Don't be stupid, Godfrey," said the squire with a scornful laugh. "Any woman would want to marry into our family. Do you want to marry her? There's no other woman I want to marry," said Godfrey, avoiding his father's eyes. "Well then, let me speak to her father for you, since you aren't." Brave enough to do it yourself. She's a pretty girl and intelligent. No, sir. Please don't say anything at the moment," said Godfrey quickly. "I must ask her myself. Well, ask her then. When you marry her, you'll have to forget about horses and so on. It'll be good for you to do some serious work. You should get married soon." Please don't try to hurry things, sir," begged Godfrey. "I'll do what I like," said the squire firmly. "And if you don't do what I want, I'll disinherit you, and you can leave the house. Now, if you know where Dunstan's hiding—I expect you do—tell him he needn't come home. He'll pay for his own food from now on. I don't know where he is, sir." Anyway, it's you who should tell him to leave home. Don't argue with me, Godfrey," said the squire, turning back to his breakfast. "Just go and tell the servants to get my horse ready." Godfrey left the room. He was relieved that his father had not discovered the whole truth. However, he was a little worried that the squire would try to arrange his marriage with Nancy. While he was married to Molly, he could not marry Nancy, although it was his dearest wish. But as usual, he was waiting and hoping for some unexpected change in his situation, which would save him from any unpleasantness.